So my making a difference story starts a little unconventionally. I didn't set out to make a difference. I didn't see a need and decide to address it. I didn't even take a passion and decide to embrace it, or at least not consciously. I basically started out like this. So I freaked out. I had a massive panic attack because I left an institution where I'd worked for a number of years as a researcher um, because I had some caring commitments. And suddenly I was there on my own and I was thinking, well, you know, you're normally supposed to leave a job to go to another amazing job or go off to have children or perhaps to travel the world. And just hanging around on your own seemed, seemed a little bit confusing, a little bit unusual. And at the same time, my employer required three months notice, which is actually precisely long enough to really start to consider whether you've made the right life choices or not. <laughs> um, so on one particularly wobbly Wednesday, um, with the words from a meeting I'd heard a couple of weeks before about a lack of non-sport after school clubs on offer, I emailed my local school and said, would you have me along? And that's how this particular ball got rolling. Because I wanted, actually in truth I needed, something that was for me during the week for my brain. So I started running an after school club for children, um, roughly age 9 to 11, um, teaching them how to program, teaching them how to code. And I'll use the term coding because simply it's the, the most accessible term for the, for the generation, for the age group that I'm working with. Um, and two thoughts struck me within about the first five minutes of the session. And my first thought was, why on earth have I not done this sooner? Because I was having the most amazing amount of fun. And my second thought, very much related to my first thought, was, is everybody else having as much fun as me? Because I would have been gutted if nobody had come back in week two. Thankfully, that didn't happen. In fact, we grew from eight children to just under 40, which is, is a considerable leap. Um, but I have an amazing teacher and two other wonderful volunteers who make that quite manageable. And each week, we just have our best time. Using visual programming um, resources like Scratch from the lovely people at MIT, we can have fun and we can learn to program all at the same time. So gone are the days when I learned to program where if you made a spelling mistake or you missed a bit of crucial syntax, it basically felt like your life was over. <laughs> because you would have to then spend countless hours scrolling through screeds of code trying to find that blasted error. Nowadays, with visual programming, examples like Scratch here, we can drag and drop and click together these Lego bricks of code so that we can get the semblance of a game or an application up and running in, in five minutes. And then creativity really explodes. We have made hundreds of games, some of them educational, some of them dramatic, <laughs> some of them action-packed, all of them amazing. Because the kids here are not just making animations, they're making games. They're thinking about user controls. They're thinking about gameplay, how to score, how to win. They're thinking about randomizing variables, how to make it harder for the end user. They're thinking about adding sound. How do I add in a timer? How do I add in a high scoreboard? Really challenging stuff, because these guys typically are nine to 11 years old. And creativity knows no bounds. During this process, creativity knows no bounds. Because I can tell you, once you have seen a bowl of cheesy puffs racing a buffalo across the moon, you have pretty much seen everything. <laughs> Actually, each week they surprise me. So this early grassroots teaching them how to code, thinking through the logic of their game, problem solving the challenges along the way, has been truly transformational for our group. And I don't use that word lightly. In fact, if I was honest, I wouldn't have used that word at all if it wasn't for our lovely teacher insisting that it really is true. And I think, actually, it's transformed me too. The title of this talk, Coding the Future, came from those kids, because they are, they're talking about the fact that they're learning these skills and having these experiences that will shape and allow them to code their own future, which I think is fantastic. So why am I telling you what I do in my fun time? Well, because I'm passionate about coding and young people, and I'm passionate about what that offers. So for me, coding is important for three reasons. So the first reason is it's education for the future. We are moving away from this idea of teaching children to become computer operators, having this two-dimensional passive experience with technology. 
and moving towards teaching them how to be creative digital technologists, encouraging them to create and make and design technology. And this isn't a random fad, this is absolutely essential and definitely why we've seen curriculum changes south of the border. Because we know that these digital skills are important. So recently there was a report, it was the Digital Skills in Tomorrow's World report, and they had these somewhat four broad categories. And if we think about these categories, and I'm going to ask you to indulge me because I'm going to break you into these categories. So we've got four categories. So this small section over here, you're going to represent 2.2 million jobs in the current marketplace. And we're going to call you, and don't be offended, the digital muggles, because there is no digital skills required for your job. And in fact, as far as your job is concerned, digital skills may as well be witchcraft or wizardry. Now the next section, you guys are almost five times as big as these guys. You represent 10.8 million jobs. And you guys are our digital citizens. So you can confidently and purposefully buy goods and services online, you can communicate, and you can find and seek information. And my next section here, you're a little bit bigger than them, not massively. You represent about 13.6 million jobs. And you're our digital workers. So you can do everything they can do, but you can work with more complex systems. And some of you may even use some forms of coding to pull data out of a data set or work with some statistics. And our final group, you're quite small. You're not as small as the first group, but you guys are our digital makers. And this is the growing market. You guys can do things like make complex macros in an Excel spreadsheet, all the way through to software development and innovation. And what this report shows us is the digital makers and the digital workers and the digital citizens combined make up over 90% of the current jobs. So over 90% already require digital skills. And we live in an environment now where the uh, technical and technological innovation is happening on an almost daily basis. So this will continue to grow. So developing digital skills is essential for our economic growth. So my second reason is that experience is everything. So I'm a really strong believer about giving children opportunity to try anything. Because how will a child discover that they have a passion or an ability for trampolining if they've never seen or set foot on one before? Or a passion or a talent for tennis if they've never had a chance to pick up a racket and hit a ball. And it's the same with coding. So if we give people, young people, the chance to try coding and try computing, we might just ignite a passion that may have lain dormant for some time to come. But it's not just about the next tech superstar. Because for me, coding is thinking, and that's my third reason. Because what I love about going into schools and to after school clubs and teaching kids how to code is it's so much more. The cross-curricular skills are just amazing because these kids are problem solving and they're using logic and structure and sequencing and they're being creative and they're collaborating and communicating with one another and they're planning and organizing what they want to do. They're using decomposition, they're breaking down a bigger problem into smaller, more achievable chunks. They're using generalization, they're taking the knowledge they've had from a week before and reapplying it to a new problem and so much more. And it's just brilliant to see. And the best part of it is actually most of the time they don't realize they're using these skills because they're having fun and they're writing games. And a lot's made about how transferable these skills are to other STEM subjects, to so other science, technology, engineering, and maths. But for me, these are life skills. So what teaching coding is, is teaching how to think. So I'm just going to tell you a quick story about, about one of the boys that I've come across. And his, his name is Jake, and he is just one of the type of people who struggles a little bit with planning and structure and decomposition and breaking down the, the challenge into smaller targets. And he came with this most amazing idea for a game, and he wanted it to be the most amazing, funniest, most awesome game in the room. That was the challenge he'd set himself. And he jumped right in, he tried to code it. And it just didn't work out for him. It just wasn't quite working out. And he didn't want to compromise on the idea because you know, he was motivated to make it work just how he wanted. And so he took a step back because he almost gave up, but he didn't. He took a step back and he looked at his problem from a different angle and he started to, to decompose his problem and break it up into chunks and go, well, if I can get this bit working, then I'll add on these other bits. 
And so what he did was he changed his approach and he transformed his learning, which was brilliant. But what was even better, apart from seeing his wonderful face when he was excited after sharing everybody and everybody agreed it was the most awesome game in the room that day, <laughs> was that he then reapplied it into a different situation. So he took that back into the classroom where they did a classroom challenge where they had to get everybody from one end of the room to the other end of the room without touching the floor. Now this child would never have volunteered himself to lead this experience previously, but he now led the experience, he broke down the challenge into smaller chunks, he organized everybody, and he led them to a successful completion, and he had the face, an amazing smiling face. Um, and it can all be to do with coding, but coding had some influence on him. But the best bit in that story is that the teacher cried mm -hmm. because it was such a transformation for him and he was so proud of himself. So I'm gonna change tact for the last part of this and I'm just gonna ask you to indulge me and I'm gonna ask you to trust me by closing your eyes and I would like you to imagine a typical computer scientist. <laughs> now I would like you to imagine a computer programmer and now I would like you to imagine a geek. <laughs> Now, for some of you, that image will have had some similar traits. Um, others, it will have varied a bit. Now, I'd ask you to open your eyes. How many people imagine <laughs> someone who looked a little bit like this? Honest? Yeah. OK. How many people imagine someone like me? Probably a lot less. Because stereotypes exist in this field and in others. So what are we going to do about it? How can we help? Well, we have a gender balance problem in the tech industry, but we have another problem in the tech industry too. We have a skill shortage, but sadly, nearly half the working population, the women, seem disengaged with this particular workspace. So if we can, through coding clubs in primary schools, start to, to work where there is no gender division, or if we can create these positive digital experiences before there's this confidence gap, before it becomes socially unacceptable to say you're doing computing, then maybe we can ignite a passion in these young girls and do it at numbers large enough to facilitate a real significant cultural change. I know I have a part to play in that as a woman in tech. The problem isn't a single point problem. It happens along a continuum. And as such, change needs to happen along the whole continuum too. There is absolutely a place for a rock star academic or tech evangelist boldly going where no woman has gone before. But, and this is the important but, there's a place for a normal woman in tech like me too, to be seen and heard, albeit to a different audience. After all, how many nine-year-old girls would care less whether the current CEO of Google is a woman or not? Not many, because their place on the women in tech journey is too far apart. What does make a difference to that nine-year-old girl is having an opportunity to try coding, to try computing, and to be valued for her contribution. I'm not naive to the, to the fact that when I go into schools and I talk about tech and coding, I'm a girl, hope you've noticed, <laughs> hence the dress. Um, but when I go into, into schools, I am, I'm chipping away at that social norm. I'm chipping away at that socially accepted stereotype. And that's great for the girls. But you know what? That's way more important for the boys too. Because when those boys get to secondary, further or higher education, I want it to be perfectly unremarkable for them to discover that there are girls in their class, in their teams, or indeed that they are taught by them. If we can, through adding coding clubs into schools before there is any gender division, do that, that would be great. Because when I was an undergraduate, in a particularly techy conversation one day, the boy sat next to me, turned around and said, you know, you're a girl, you actually know some things. <laughs> I still don't know quite how I should have responded to him. So in my ideal world, we are gonna have computing and coding activities at primary school level, you know, early grassroots involvement, to start changing that social norm, to change the culture around tech, so that at some point in the future, it's gonna be unremarkable and not even worth mentioning that there's a girl in the team. So coding can be truly transformational. There's a huge array of resources out there, freely available for anyone to, get jo to join in. So no matter where you are in the world, you could, you could have an impact and, and join in with this particular movement, if you want to call it. 
For me, coding is truly transformational. Coding allows us to create and make and do whatever we want. Our only limitation is our own imagination. So let us now, all together, code the future. Thank you.